Hello. Hello. Bonjour. My name is Matt Rabel, and I'm an old-fashioned Java developer. I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana with no electricity and no running water. And I had to walk two miles to the bus stop every day. And yes, it was uphill both ways. I have a strange obsession with Volkswagen vans and VW buses. And I'm happy to say that this is the first stop on the bus tour 2016. This magnificent vehicle was finished last week after 10 years. And uh, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So now I'd like to learn a little bit about you. Are you a Java developer? Raise your hand if you're a Java developer. OK, that's like 90% of the room. If you've been doing web development for 20 years, raise your hand. 20 years, we got about 5 or 10 of us. How about 10 years? OK, that's 30%. How many have done it just for a year? So we got a few newbies. All right, good for you guys. How many people like JSF? <laughs> we got two, three. That's, a, that's higher than normal. Um, anyone like GWT? GWT? That's about the same. That used to be all the rage, right? And now it and GWT. Who likes JavaScript? That's like half the room. If you asked that at a Java conference five years ago, like two hands would go up and people would start booing. So we've come a long ways. So if you're doing web development, you've been doing it for 20 years like I have, you're probably not hip anymore. Do you want to be a hip Java developer? That's why you're here, right? You want to get hip. So if you want to be hip with Java, one of the best ways to do is use Java 8. There's parallel collections. There's JSR 310 date and time API. There's functional interfaces with the default method, Lambda expressions, which are awesome when you get to use them. And then you can even run Nashorn or JavaScript on the JVM. So let's define what a hipster is. A hipster is one who is exceptionally aware of or interested in the latest trends and tastes. So what are the latest trends in Java land? There's annotations. They aren't that new, but it's better in XML. It used to be XML hell. Now what is it? Annotation hell. Now you get four or five annotations on one method or one class. Right? It looks ugly, but it's better in XML. You have environments, you have dev, test, and production, which is a nice way to talk to one data database when you're talking to development, a uh, different one in test. Microservices are all the rage. When's the best time to use microservices? When you have a big team. If you have a team of five or 10, I don't recommend looking into microservices. You can build a monolith, and you can always split it up later. Containerless deployment. Spring Boot is big on this, actually encapsulating the application container within the jar. Um, there's Drop Wizard. There's a bunch of other frameworks that do that as well. And monitoring, health, figuring out when your application is actually dying before it dies or seeing what the performance is. So Spring has one of the best track records for hipness in Java land. And Spring Boot is a great way to integrate Spring or start with Spring. So you create a standalone Spring application with Spring Boot. You can embed Tomcat, Jetty, or Undertow. It provides opinionated starter palms, or you can use Gradle as well. Um, and you know it's an easy way just to get started. Instead of having a big long palm file with a bunch of you know different dependencies in there, you just get a couple. It also automatically configures Spring whenever possible, provides production ready features such as metrics and health checks, and absolutely no code generation, no requirement for XML. And even Grails 3 is based on it. Spring initializer, start.spring.io is a great way to get started with Spring Boot. You just go there, you can even curl it, you pick your options. Boom, generates a project for you, and you can get going. So how many people have not heard of Spring Boot? We've got two, three, four, five, six. OK. The last talk I did, there was, what do we have, 15 people, maybe 20? And there was only one guy that hadn't heard of Spring Boot. And, uh, and I did a demo for him. So should we do a Spring Boot demo? Or are we a little short on time? No, nope, that guy says no. OK, we're going to skip the Spring Boot demo. And the reason for that is Josh Long, if you've never seen Josh Long speak, he's an excellent speaker. He'll be here tomorrow. And he's speaking an hour before I am right now. So it'll be 13.55 tomorrow. 
and I recommend and go see his talk. He'll talk all about Spring Boot. And if you want to hit me up after this, I'm happy to you know, do a demo then as well. So we'll take this slide, Spring Boot demo. We'll say, wow, that was great. Good job, Matt. <laughs> right? So just talking about Spring Boot makes me feel hip. So I got my Converse shoes here. Take off my fancy dress shoes. Put on the Converse. Notice they match the bus. I'm going to wear them to Volkswagen shows all summer. So let's look at the latest, trip, the latest trends in web development. JavaScript MVC frameworks. CSS3 with animations. Mobile first. The reason I like to develop mobile first is because it reduces the number of features that end up in an application. If you're developing a mobile application, you can basically trim out a lot of the fat and just have basically what's needed. And then if you need to scale up to a desktop, it's not that hard to do. Front end optimization. This is something that I've done for so many clients, and it's, it always blows my mind when they don't think of this. I often go in, and they have an application that's really slow, takes a while to load. They're having problems with you know, performance, and they basically usually suspect it's on the back end. And they're like, can you do some performance analysis and test us or tell us what's wrong? And a lot of times, you just run like why slow on there, or you run you know, page speed from Google, and you find out that they haven't even implemented gzipping. Right? And there's no expires headers. And those two things alone, I've been able to speed up applications double the speed. Um, so it's twice as fast as before. So um, front end optimization is very important. And then REST APIs. REST APIs is the way that you know, we're getting data nowadays. It used to be this is a new thing, and it used to be SOAP, and now it's, it's pretty much REST has won. So AngularJS is one of the hottest, if, that, if not the hottest, JavaScript MVC framework. If you look at Google Trends, you compare it to Ember.js or React.js or Knockout or Backbone. Knockout and Backbone used to be popular. And uh, it just blows them away. It's the uh, struts one of J2EE. When uh, J2EE came out, you know, it wasn't wildly popular. Servlets were kind of cool. But I don't know if you remember, struts one just took the world by storm. And all of a sudden, recruiters were asking for it and things like that. So it really you know, became popular quickly. And AngularJS is the same thing. Um, you could say that it's already legacy because Angular 2 is coming, but it's ubiquitous. It's out there. There's a lot of people that want to use it. There's a lot of people already using it. If you need more proof that it's the most popular one, you can look at tags on Stack Overflow, stars on GitHub, or compare it to traditional server-side frameworks. If you do a, a similar Google Trends and you look at Spring MVC or Struts, it basically blows them away as well. So wouldn't it be hip if someone married AngularJS and Spring Boot, and if they had a bootstrap, the most popular CSS framework in the world? Well, guess what? Julian Dubois did it. Jay Hipster, baby. <laughs> Let's give him a hand. So on the client side, it generates a single page web application. It's got responsive web design built in. Bootstrap, to me, is one of those things that we always wanted in Java land. It was what JSF was meant to be. It was basically a, a component-based framework that allowed you to create grids and things like that and drop downs very easily. And, uh, and in Java, we always tried to do it on the server side. And it wasn't until Bootstrap came along that everyone was like, wow, why don't we do it on the client side? Like, it works so much better there. So you just add some HTML, a couple classes, and boom, you got your widget. Uh, it's got HTML5 boilerplate built in, AngularJS, full internationalization support. It's got SaaS support if you want it. You can also use WebSockets. Uh, it's got the Yeoman development workflow. And I apologize, but I've been saying Yeoman for like a year. It's Yeoman, just so you know, and you don't have to make the same mistake. Y-E-O-M-A-N. Um, easy installation of new JavaScript library. So it's got this whole workflow built in that's just awesome. Uh, the foundational frameworks, it's built on Spring Boot for the back end. Spring Security is in there, AngularJS, Bootstrap, and Metrics. So you have all, these, all this information, all these metrics about your application as it's running that you can inspect and look at. Um, as far as when you generate your project, you can use Maven or Gradle. You can use cookie-based authentication, JWT or OAuth2, SQL or NoSQL database. 
You can even have caching with EH Cache or Hazelcast and Elasticsearch. Everyone likes search? You need to search your entities? There you go, Elasticsearch. And we used to support Gulp and Grunt, but guess what? Grunt's not that popular anymore, so we made a decision on the team, and now it's just Gulp. And so Yeoman is a tool that basically has three different types of tools. Um, scaffolding, which is a tool Yo, which is an awesome name for a command. Yo, create me an app. I need a drink after that. <laughs> the build tool, you can use Grunt or Gulp. And then package man, like Bower or NPM. So those are the, the three main components of Yeoman. And with Bower, you can easily install new JavaScript libraries. You just type a command, and you don't have to go out and download it. And uh, build optimization, live reload with Grunt or Gulp. Doesn't matter what tool you use for those, but um, certainly helps. And then testing with Karma and PhantomJS. How many people have heard of Browser Sync? How many people have not? And then there's six of you sleeping because you didn't raise your hands. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so Browser Sync, if you haven't heard of it and you're a web developer, it will change your life. Like you get your money's worth just from this talk just by learning about Browser Sync. What Browser Sync does for you is it basically just reloads your browser for you. So instead of you know typing in your ID, you know switching screens, going back to your browser, hitting refresh, it does all that for you. So if you have two monitors, you just code away all day, save, see the change, save, see the change. You never even have to interact with your monitor or your, your browser because Browser Sync refreshes for you. And that includes CSS, JavaScript, HTML, all that. It's one of the best tools I've ever seen for web development, so I highly recommend it. So now, to get things started, I'd like to uh, do a demo of JHipster just to show you how it works. So one thing that might happen um, from now on, because I've made it this far, is I will forget to sync this screen and that screen. So if I start to talk about stuff and I haven't mirrored my screens back, make sure and say something, because I might be typing away and talking, and you guys will be like, what's he talking about? So just to warn you, that could happen. So first we'll mirror, and then we'll go. Can everyone see that OK? Yep. So um, one of the first mistakes you'll make with Jay Hipster is you'll be like, yo, Jay Hipster, make me an app. And this is the first time I've ever used it. So um, not the first time I've used it, just what happened to me the first time I used it. Notice we have a, a message there that says, application will be generated in users MRable. So this is different from Maven archetypes or, or other projects that I've used in Java, where they generate the directory and then they put all the files in it. With Yeoman, they put everything in your current directory. And there's a bunch of like dot files and stuff like that. So you can imagine if you generate the file in your home directory, all of a sudden you have, I don't know, 20 new files, five new directories, and you don't know which one's jhipster generated. So that's why we put the message there. You want to make sure that you create the directory first. Oh, it's already there. I was practicing. Then you go into it and you say, yo, J Hipster. And it says, hey, we're going to put it in this directory. I'm like, OK. And I'm going to do a monolithic application. The reason for that is because I'm a small team. It's just me, maybe a couple others. Maybe I'll hire Abby to help me out. But you know, there's uh, the best reason for microservices is you need to scale up to 50 developers or 100 developers. But if you have a small team of 5 or 10, you might not need them. And if you really want to see microservices, Julian's got to talk later this afternoon. Base name is going to be blog. We'll call it org jhipster for our default package name. And I'm just going to use a lot of the defaults because it makes it easier. We'll just do HTTP session authentication, but you can see I can use OAuth 2 or JWT. If you want to use social login, Google, Facebook, or Twitter, no thank you. SQL works for me. Production database, I'll just go with my SQL. And then development, H2 with disk-based persistence. We'll use the hcache because it's the default. Search engine. Nah, I don't really need it for this demo. Clustered HTTP sessions, nope. WebSockets, nope. Um, but come on, Maven versus Gradle? Who's hipper? Gradle. <laughs> We're not going to use SAS. We'll do internationalization. And you'll see here you can pick the default language, the native language, English. And then you can pick, you know, 
additional languages. So if you want to install all of these, there's a whole bunch of them. I think we're up to 30 or something like that. You can uh, you can certainly select those. And then testing frameworks, Gatling, Cucumber, Protractor. I'll do uh, Protractor and Gatling. And then it starts building it. And if you thought Maven downloaded the internet, holy cow, NPM's a whole new ball game. Like, look at this thing. We have this app, right? Count lines of code. And uh, it's not too bad, right? JavaScript, 4700, Java. 4400, so it's about even, you know, Java, JavaScript. Wait till after that NPM install finishes, and uh, it's a whole new ballgame. There's like a million lines of code. And that's because that's how NPM works, right? It installs everything locally in a node modules directory. JavaScript doesn't have jars like we do in Java, so it's all source code that's been put in there. So that's still going. Does anyone know how to make NPM faster? It's easy. All you do is NPM set progress equals false. It's got a progress bar normally that you'd see here going. And uh, if you set it to false, it speeds it up by two times. So that's kind of cool. So we'll open up the project in IntelliJ and take a look at it. Oh, it doesn't like it, doesn't exist. Try it again. Right? Or reboot. But then npm install it fail. OK, fine. We'll do a new project. And then you want to do static web, not storm path. That's one of my clients. They're a great client. Blog. And then to make everything easier to read, you go into presentation mode. We'll import the Gradle project. It does make IntelliJ's like buttons look kind of funny, but and you got to click on it in a special place. There we go. So now this is the project that JHipster creates by default. You can see there's a whole bunch of files in here, and you're like, what are all these dot files for? Well, this dot .yorc right here is what's going to help us most if you ever have issues with your project. This tells you the options that you picked when you created your project. So it's got you know, the base name, all the options you installed, and uh, you know, other things in there. Travis, if you check this into GitHub, it would automatically set up a Travis job for you. You could easily do that. Um, one of my favorite things is this editor config. I didn't even know about this. If you drop an editor config file in your project, it configures things like indent style, spaces or tabs, size of indents. And uh, it automatically configures most IDEs, so you don't have to like, you know, tell those guys on your team to stop using tabs. And uh, you know, for JSON, it'll do you know those things. But then the real interesting part is, you know, where's the code? So there's obviously Docker support right there. Um, but in you know domain, it's got a user, it's got persistent token, audit event. But the real interesting stuff is under here with the Spring configuration. So it uses Spring Boot, like I mentioned. Spring Security, if you've used Spring Security, you might notice it's got the web security enabled, global message security, so you can actually put annotations on methods. And then all this should be familiar. CSRF is enabled. Filters for uh, CSRF cookie generator, remember me. Form login, log out. Even Jackson configuration, database configuration. So. We generated 4,000 lines of code for you, right? That's pretty nice. Thanks, Jay Hipster. You're cool. And Timeleaf. If you want to use Timeleaf and you didn't want to use you know, traditional Angular JS that we support in that front end, um, you can use Timeleaf. We don't just don't generate like a UI for you. Um, but there's nothing stopping you from contributing that code. And so that's, that's most of the project. The REST API is right here. There's an account resource you'll see. And these are all just. You know, Spring controllers, but we call them resources. You can see REST controller there. That's from Spring Boot. Register, activate. And then down here in our web app, there's all the Angular stuff. So the modules, the entry point, that imports all the different dependencies, constants, states for uh, you know, navigating to different areas. And this all follows uh, John Papa's style guide for AngularJS. So we're doing you know, best practices for Angular. One of the most interesting things, I think, besides Angular, though, is the liquid-based stuff. So liquid-based 
configures it so we can generate the actual database for you and do change logs. So you can migrate, add new tables, change columns, change relationships, and all that's right here in this initial schema. It generates all the tables for you. We, we prefix them with JHI so you don't have namespace conflicts with different databases. So that's pretty cool. And it's still running back here because we're on a slow connection. The worst it's ever taken is 35 minutes, so hmm, hopefully we'll get through that. I'll just show you some more stuff in the meantime. This users.csv, so one of the, the features that Liquidbase has is it has the ability to actually import default data. So you can see here, here's our default roles, our default users, authorities, and then it also has Spring f profiles built in. So for development, um, there's a dev profile that says, hey, talk to H2. There's a production profile that says, hey, talk to MySQL. And then if we had other options, for instance, using Elasticsearch, then it would have those as well. Make sure I'm on the Wi-Fi. And then templates for sending emails, activation email, all done with Timeleaf, which is a pretty nice feature. So you don't have to worry about actually creating those templates. And then internationalization. We just have English and French right now. Still running. Here's something you can do. I don't know if it'll kick in, but local NPM. Has anyone ever used this? So it's a way of actually doing like Maven-like stuff where it'll actually cache everything locally and keep all your files locally. So I got 100% because I synced it up last night. And we'll kill this and then do just use the local one. Where to go? NPM set registry. NPM I. Should be faster now because this in the background is like, hey, yeah, I'm getting all your stuff. Hold on, man. It's all local. It's like my favorite part of doing npm install. Come on, you can do it. So did everyone get out and enjoy the nice weather the last couple days? <laughs> We're closer. It runs a bunch of tests to make sure that you've installed everything, your environment's configured correctly. And of course, if you didn't have NPM or Node installed, then a lot of this would fail. It would tell you, hey, I don't have that installed. Um, Bower as well. So there's a few setup items you need to do, and you need to have Java 8 installed. So there we go. It created it all. Now we can do Bower install and pull in all our JavaScript files. So even though we had all the source, we didn't have you know those JavaScript sources, which I'll show you, can amount to quite a bit. Count lines of code now. Oh, boy. I might have to come back to that. So the cool thing about jhipster is you can also generate stuff. So yo, jhipster entity. We're going to create a blog application. Let me show you that. Basic blog application. We looked at its configuration. We'll generate some CRUD entities, basically a blog, an entry, and tags. And we'll limit the blogs to the current user and allow HTML and deploy it to Heroku all in 20 minutes. So um, we probably what, went through 10 minutes so far. So if anyone's timing, then uh, take 10 minutes off the top, and we'll see if we can nail it. Um, this is what the, the entity diagram looks like. User comes with jhipster, a blog, one to many with entry, many to many with tags. So we'll go from there. So. One of the things you can do is yo j hipster entity blog. Do you want to add a field? Yes. Name your field. We'll give it a name. String. Validation rules. Yes. Required. Do you want to add another field? Yep. We got a handle. String. Required. Minimum length. Two. No more fields. Relationship. Yep. User. And name of the relationship is user. And many to one. 
and we want to use login. When we see the user drop down, we have another with entry, and it's one to many. No more. And then you can have a DTO wrapped around your you know entity object. We're not going to use one. Um, you can also have a separate service class. I'm not going to use one. And then pagination. No, that's OK. And so then it overwrites your master because it adds a new file to generate that table. So I'm going to overwrite that. And if you look, it generated a whole bunch of files. The cool thing is Java's gotten so good, we only need three files for Java. right? We need the entity, we need the repository, and the REST endpoint. Um, but Angular's got all these design patterns that says you need 10 files. So we have a lot of files for doing the CRUD with Angular. Um, so this whole thing, you know, answering all those questions can be kind of tedious, right, from the command line. And, uh, and, you know, you might make some mistakes. So one of the things that the uh, J Hipster team has created is JDL Studio. So you're not a real project until you have your own domain language. And uh, we have our own domain language now called JDL. Java, or J Hipster, domain language. And this guy allows you to actually, in your browser, create all these entities and these tags. So you can see here, this saved the last session that I had. I have blog, name, handle, entry, title, content, date, tag, relationship, one to many, many to one. And you can even do the pagination here. I have entry and tag with infinite scroll, but I didn't put anything for blog. And then those service things with DTO are down here. They're just commented out to show you that you can enable those as well. So you hit Control S on that, and it saves it. And uh, I already have one in here, so let me delete the old one. And I'll rename this one. And then you go back to the command line, and you're like, ha-ha, yo, J hipster import JDL downloads. Boom. And we'll overwrite that one. And now it generated all my entities. Sweet, J hipster, thank you. Now we can say, OK, well, let's run it. And this coloring is awesome. That's from Spring Boot, though. We didn't do that. So thank you, Spring Boot. Well, that's not what we wanted to do. So now if we open it up in our browser, Angular is not defined. I've had this before. You little npm install. I've never had it fail in a demo, though. That's all right. You guys know it works, right? It's just demo gods. So one of the cool things with Browser Sync, get in the right directory, you can just run gulp, and it'll automatically refresh your browser. So see, you just have to try again. There it goes. So this is Browser Sync. Um, these are basic features, so admin, admin. You look in, we have these entities that we generated. But the cool thing is this is all the stuff that JHipster comes with. So we've got all our users. We can manage those. You can modify them. Um, we'll make this a bit bigger, make it a bit bigger. And metrics, so it's got all this information about your application. All the different timings, all the statistics. It's got the help, so emails down. Database is up. Configuration, you can see all the spring application.yaml properties. Audits, we authenticated successfully. Logs, and even if you like the old swagger docs, right? Shows you all your REST endpoints, you can see all those. So it's pretty slick, all that comes out of the box. Now you can create a new blog entry, right? We'll call this admins blog, handles admin. Users admin, here's a users blog.
And then we'll create some tags. VW. I like VWs. Angular JS. DevOps France. Then you can say we'll create some new entries. Abby and I went to the Eiffel Tower today. It was fun. <laughs> we didn't go at midnight. We went at like 9. And do that on users. DevOps France. All right, and then another one. The bus is done. I'm so happy. That was last week, 13th. I remember that day. I picked it up around 11 a.m. And then, well, I'm the admin now. VW. Okay. I'll probably do another users one just to show you something. So users, uh, powder day, last weekend. Who likes skiing? Yeah. I had two days last weekend, knee-deep powder. It was awesome. Abby had to shovel the driveway. She didn't get to go. Sorry. That was the 16th. And we started early at 8. That's the user's blog. Mm, no tags. Okay. So one of the problems you'll see here is our entities, right? Everyone can see everything. Like if you log in here, you could go and modify someone's blog. So that's kind of not good. Um, let's change that. If we go into log resource, It's fairly easy to do. We'll look at the structure here. And get all blogs. So this has got this find all, which you need to change to find. Is it still indexing? Yep, IntelliJ. How long has it been indexing for? Like, we opened this thing 10 minutes ago, right? OK, find by user is current user. So. J Hipster is smart enough to say, hey, you might need that sort of logic in your application. So in this blog repository from Spring Data JPA, we extend JPA repository. And then it says, hey, you might want to know who needs to limit that by the current user. So that's pretty slick. We say OK. Go ahead and compile that. So there you go. It recompiled. Thank you. Oh, where'd our window go? There we are. There we are. You know, took out the user. If we log in, as uh, we sign out, log in as user. We look at the blogs. We only got the user. So, you know, that was enough to do that. Now, but if we go to entries, still got a little issue there, right? So, we got to fix that as well. Go to entry resource, get all entries, and we say, OK, we need to change that to find by blog user, log in order by date descending. I, I mean, easy, easy method to remember. So what JHipster provides is a security utils that allows you to get the current user's login information. And this is Spring Data JPA that allows you to say, hey, here's my finder method. Generate an HQL query for me. And it does that as long as you create that within your JPA repository. So we go ahead and create that. And we say, OK, well, compile that. And go back to this one. Compile that. Then go back to our browser. Not you. And it's got all those. Now it limited, took all the, the admins out, right? So you can say, OK, we'll sign out, sign in as admin. Look at those entries, and it limits those. So the nice thing is Spring Boot in the background uses its dev tools to actually reload Spring. And we never stopped and started our app server, right? It actually restarted for us. So even though we just compiled things, it actually did all that in the background. And this is the one thing I will give Eclipse. If I had used Eclipse, I could have just saved those files and it would recompiled for me. And yes, I know you can configure IntelliJ to do that, but um, I didn't do it. So um, let's make a, a few changes. If we look at the, the UI here for entries, 
you can see like I'm so happy and you want to be like hey I am so happy right EM because it's a blog post and then you're like what <laughs> it doesn't process HTML come on so you go back to IntelliJ and you're like okay let's look at entries and you look at that responsive table and you're like okay well I know that with Angular you can use an ng bind HTML. And you can put that entry content in there. And then, boom, it's going to work. And you're like, what? It's not even there. And then you open up developer tools, and it's like attempting to use an unsafe value in a safe context. And you're like, well, I'm not doing cross site scripting, but thank you for listening. And then you go, OK, well, app module. And you say, well, ng sanitize is what I need to process HTML. You go back to your browser, and it puts it in there. Notice browser sync refreshed for me. I didn't have to actually go in and refresh my browser. It just made that happen. So that's pretty slick. And then you can go in there and say, well, one of the things I don't like is when I do this, that's, that's not a very big text field. So let's make that into a text area. Entry dialog. And then we have this content. We say text area, take that out, take that out. And we probably want that to be rows equals, I don't know, five. Go back, not you, Firefox. Now we got that, right? Again, reloads, hardly had to do anything. The last thing we're going to want to do is go into entries. And we got this nice table here, but it doesn't really look like a blog. Now it looks like a blog, all right? You got your, you know, latest entries up there. If we were to log out, log back in as admin. Look at entries. Quest is done. Okay, so let's deploy that to Heroku now. Yo, J Hipster Heroku. That's all it takes. We'll do. J Hipster, DevOx, France. I got to deploy to the EU. It's closer. And so what this does is actually puts database configuration classes into your project that allows you to read from environment variables on Heroku. There's a bunch of other features that we have when you use the microservice stuff, um, but we're doing a plain old monolith. Um, it just works really nicely. So in the meantime, I can show you why that's going on. Uh, one of the slick features is gulp eye test. I don't know if we still have it running, do we? Let me make sure. Localhost 8080. Still running. So gulp eye test basically runs protractor tests and verifies that your whole application works as you expect it to. What? You... And then you get failures, and you're like, hey, it didn't work like I expected to. And then you try again. And you're like, you should work this time. Is anyone use Protractor Selenium? Yeah, that happens a lot, right? You put it in Jenkins, and you're like, it failed. Why did it fail? And then you go back and look, and you're like, there's no reason why it failed. And so I like Protractor, I like Selenium, um, but I like it mostly for running tests locally, just to verify you didn't break anything. I think hooking up in Jenkins or Bamboo or you know Travis, they're great ideas, but a lot of times it really has false positives that um, kind of eat up a lot of your time. But it's cool that JHipster has these, so you can basically tell if you broke anything, because a lot of times you know with JavaScript you forgot a semicolon, right? You forgot something like that, and you go to production and the whole thing doesn't work. So. It's cool to have these tests that you know verify within 45 seconds that your whole app runs and works. And there we are. So we can do Heroku logs. I have an alias for it, HL. And you can see it's still starting up there, running with prod Heroku, and it's up and running. So now we can uh, we can cancel that and do Heroku open.
There it is. Deploy it on Heroku. J Hipster, DevOps France, HerokuApp.com. Now there's no data in here, right? Because we didn't deploy our database with it, but pretty cool stuff. So J Hipster has a whole bunch of tools that you can also use. I mean, IntelliJ and Eclipse out of the box. How many people use IntelliJ? <sighs> Smart. How many people use Eclipse? How many people use Eclipse because it's free? That's like a carpenter being like, I use free hammers. right? If you use it because it's free, good for you. But don't be afraid to pay for your tools. Um, Vagrant J Hipster Development Box is a great way to just download and have a virtual box ready for you to use. You don't even have to configure your machine. There's a Docker installation. There's Docker Compose, especially for microservices. It can be very useful where you actually you know, have your code and generate it all. And uh, JDL and JDL Studio, J Hipster UML. Man, after that demo, I, I really feel hip. I can't believe I've had this thing on so long. There he is. It's my favorite part. It's harder. This is the hardest part of the whole thing. Getting that clip back there. Kind of like just tighten a knot. Should have had Abby do it for me. But then you get to see the real beauty. Tattoos, baby. J Hipster UML is another feature that we have where you can use UML editors like Modelio, UML Designer, Genmy Model, Visual Paradigm, and you can do you know visual in UML and design. And all those are documented on the website how to use those. We do load testing with Gatling. We generate those if you want them. And uh, Gatling is a great tool to do any sort of HTTP, basically performance, you know, testing. Jasmine UI testing. We support that with Protractor, like you saw. Um, we also generate Jasmine tests, and we have a number of them in there just for the default application. J Hipster modules, we have a marketplace that you can use to add features to your application. You could also contribute modules. So there's an entity audit if you want to make sure you know whenever anyone modifies an entity. There's swagger to markup, there's bootstrap material designs, and there's even a project that you can create a new module with. J Hipster 3.0 has microservices based on Spring Cloud. It's got JWT instead of XAuth. It's got hub.docker.com for a Docker image. Polarization of generated entities, removing the fast profile and job hop style guide, which I mentioned. And uh, this, is, this is a great diagram that shows you we have a JHipster registry and we have a JHipster console that are applications that you just clone and use. And then you generate your entities. And basically how it works is you'll have your gateway that has your Angular UI. And then you can have microservices. You can have five or a hundred different microservices on the back end. Your Angular UI sits on one front end, but the microservices are on the back end. And the best thing about JHipster is just the knowledge you can gain by looking at it. So here's an example of doing source maps, which is one of the hardest problems that I've had as a web developer with JavaScript is mapping the production you know, concatenated files back to the source and development. We do that for you. So look at that code and just copy and paste it. You don't have to use you know, full J Hipster stack, but you can certainly learn from the project. And then notifications for your gulp build. right? When something fails, it pops up in the corner. I wrote a book. I liked it so much. I'd use Spring Boot, and I'd use Angular for two or three years, and then I stumbled upon J Hipster about two years ago, and I just loved it. So I, I wrote it with ASCII Doctor. It's 130 pages. I developed a real world app around it. Um, you can download it for free from InfoQ. And I'm doing a talk tomorrow at noon on how I wrote that book with ASCII Doctor. It's only 15 minutes, so if you want to write a book for InfoQ, come to that. Um, in the sample app, in 21 points, um, I created the project. I had 8,500 lines of code. Once I generated the entities to do you know, the different things I wanted to do, I had 1,200 lines of code, or almost 13,000 lines of code. And then to actually write the code, to do, make it do what I wanted to do and make a good-looking UI, I only had to write 1,000 lines of code. So again, it was, a, it was a small app, but J Hipster did a lot of the, the heavy lifting for me, right? It generated a lot of that boilerplate for me. And you can see here that the, number, the ratio of Java to JavaScript to HTML kind of 
stayed the same the whole time. So if you want to learn more, follow the project on, on Twitter, star us on GitHub, um, and uh, AngularJS, obviously, if you want to learn more about that. This same talk was recorded for DevOps Belgium, and if you'd like to see it, you can see it there. And Julian, this afternoon, is, is doing a talk with the microservices stuff, so um, I encourage you to attend that. If you have any questions, please don't enter an issue on GitHub. If you do, we'll handle it. But the best place is on Stack Overflow with the jhipster tag. And uh, we have you know, Gitter IM if you want to do chat. Um, contributing if you want to contribute to the project. We have a whole document on how to do that. You can see what we're talking about on the developers list on Google Groups. And uh, if you have any questions, send me an email. Hit me up on Twitter. Or uh, I have presentations. I have code. All on GitHub. I got to be more hip. I got to mess up my hair a little. Look, there's champagne here. Got to drink some of that. I did, uh, I did try to find one of the best beers in town. I don't know if I succeeded, but I had some pretty high ratings. <laughs> the Mont 3. So if you have any questions, I'll take them. But otherwise, thanks for coming, man. Appreciate it.